Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome, and um, welcome, and I'm so happy to see a full house. This is fabulous. Give yourself a hand. Turning out for a great event tonight. And I'll say a quick hello to everyone in the overflow room. We are so over capacity tonight that we even have an overflow room here for you, Stephen. So glad that you are here tonight. Well, good evening and welcome. Welcome to this evening's talk with Stephen Peterman of Art House Co-op, the Brooklyn Art Library, and Sketchbook Project. I'm Amy Geist, Ulrich Museum of Art, Curator of Education. Um, Sketchbook Project is this wonderful crowdsourced event <laughs> project that has reached across borders. And if that's not good enough for you, you can't wait until the Sketchbook Library, mobile library, gets to your location. You can even go online and look at some of the digital uh, sketchbooks that have been created. So I'd be curious. We've already been set up for one event here on campus. Raise your hand. Who's visited Sketchbook Project, the mobile library, so far? Oh, a few people have, good. Who's planning to attend one of the upcoming events? <laughs> that looks much, much better. Well, if you didn't get to make it this morning, you have a couple more opportunities. Of course, tonight after Stephen's talk, the mobile library will be set up on McKnight Art Center Plaza. You can head on down. I promise it only takes a few seconds to get your own library card, and you can start checking out sketchbooks just willy-nilly if you would like. If that's not good enough, you've got to rush off to class. Of course, you've got another opportunity tomorrow evening as we celebrate the grand reopening of our own student gallery shift space. And I see Lisa Rundstrom in the crowd. Sketchbook Project really is about community, and we are so pleased to see so much of the community turn out this evening. Um, a big scale, large scale event like this could not happen without co-sponsors. So I want to thank the WSU School of Art and Design. They were our co-sponsor for Stephen's visit and for the Mobile Library's opportunity to come here to Wichita, Kansas. Please give them a hand. Specifically, I'd like to call out our current director for the School of Art and Design, Dr. Roy Smith. Royce, are you in the crowd? Give everybody a wave. And I believe that I saw our previous director who helped us also plan some of these events, Barry Badgett. I think he's in the overflow room. Let's give him a hand as well. So many good people. Laventa Suyak, uh, one of our professors here at Wichita State, has worked with fabulous art and design students to organize the Draw-a-thon. It goes until midnight tonight. Yes, you must participate and you must enjoy it. And also with us is Lisa Rundstrom. Lisa, give them a wave. Lisa is the director for our student-run gallery, Shift Space. Um, and I have to thank her because she was with me all along as I threw out crazy idea after crazy idea. So tomorrow evening, as you join us at Shift Space, there's two fabulous exhibitions, one including WSU alumnus Beth Post. I hope Beth is... Beth's maybe working. She's doing last minute installation, as well as work from Wichita area high school students who have been musing on the theme of capes, masks, and tights. If that's not enough for you, of course, Sketchbook Project will be set up so you can check out sketchbooks. The Wichita Pros Collective will be there. The food trucks are going to be set up. It's going to be a wonderful time. But let's be honest, you're not here to hear me. You're here to hear Stephen Peterman, who's going to talk to us a little bit about, about the role of the crowdsourced art object in the 21st century. Please join me, everyone, in welcoming Stephen Peterman. Hey, guys. How's it going? Uh, I, I did want to thank uh, everybody here, especially Amy and, and the school, for bringing us here. We, we go to a lot of different cities, and we've had quite a, quite a welcome here, so it's, it's been really exciting. Um, so a few days ago, I was uh, being interviewed by a Japanese tourist magazine, and um, I get interviewed a lot, and they usually ask like five of the same exact questions, but this, this lady really was like digging deep, and uh, so she started to ask me, um, how we're funded and, and, and how much money we make. And I hate when people ask me this question because it's slightly personal. And, um, but what uh, I told her was, you know, we're, we're an arts organization. We uh, don't make a ton of money. Uh, it's a labor of love. Like all of our staff loves to do this and that's why we do it and we're exhausted. But, 
but it's worth it. And I think she kind of like read into, I've said that a thousand times and was like, well, then why do you still do this if you don't make, you know, if you're never going to make tons of money? And, and it was funny that she asked me this question because I've actually been kind of pondering this uh, for the past year or so of my life. I've done this for seven years. I started to do this in 2006. I was a sophomore in, in art school at Savannah College of Art and Design. And, and, I, and, and I, I started thinking about, about why I do this. And um, there were kind of three things that came to mind when I started to talk about this. Well, actually, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to talk about the, the fact that as an art business, you're constantly struggling with two things. You're, you have the creative conceptual side that, that gets you really excited. It's like that midnight talk with your roommate where you're like, oh my God, we could do this really cool thing and it, it'll be great. And then you wake up the next morning and you're like, but I, I got to make money. I got to eat. I, I can't just, you know, work for free. And so I'm personally always having this struggle between the, the conceptual side and the business side. When I grew up, my mother is this like amazing creative spirit and always like kind of like whatever happens when it goes and kind of instilled that into me. And my father is a businessman from day one. Uh, when I wanted to do anything in life, I had to present it to him and convince him this was like a sustainable idea for my life. Um, so I grew up with these like really two extremes, but I think that it's kind of this like funny metaphor for what the Sketchwork Project is. It's this great conceptual free spirit with like a business side to it. So in the past year that I've been like kind of wondering why I'm doing this, I, I've, I've come to realize that there are three things that I learned from doing the Sketchwork Project. Uh, the first thing is that we all really, really want to be inspired by other people. We are constantly looking for ways to be inspired by people. I mean, I'm sure someone in this room is like looking at Instagram right now and not listening to me. Um, we, the second thing is that we're, we're, which is kind of ironic to the first, is that we are constantly now creating human interaction. I think uh, we are, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, they all literally exist to share your life with other people, to inspire your friends, to connect with people all over the world, but you're really not connecting with anyone at all because it's just an image on a screen. Um, so I, I think that there's this like kind of movement for human interaction and, and I think that's, that's partly why people like the Sketcher Project. And my third thing, which was kind of the biggest surprise, I think, of all, um, was we, you know, we, we sent out these books and we think people are going to just draw and sketch and it'll be a cool art show and we'll move on with our lives. But the thing that we realized was everyone has this like ridiculously amazing story that they want to tell. Um, and, and the one cool thing is that when all of these stories come together, they look like this. So um, the, story, the story of the Sketchbook Project started when I was uh, probably a teenager. I always wanted to be creative. I always had this creative bug. I'm not a very good technical artist. I never really knew. I was an okay photographer. I was an okay, like, pretending to know how to sketch person, but not, not a good, fine artist. But I wanted to be creative. I would write music. I would write poems. I would throw my own uh, music shows and open up for myself and sell tickets to see myself. Like, it didn't work out too well. I couldn't sing. I wasn't really that good at guitar. Um, but the thing that I always felt was that it was a really lonely process. It's really lonely to be really creative and not be surrounded by other creative people um, and not really know what to do with your, your own creativeness. Uh, so when I got into college and I went to art school and I was like, I was taking printmaking classes and it was fine, but like still you're like lost in your own head. You're not really sure um, what to do with this. And they don't really teach you in art school. Like once you figure out how to actually make the work, it's like, now what do I do? Um, and so I was kind of like really stuck on this. And so I started creating these interactive installations where I would like cover my studio with like screen printed squares and ask people to come in and like just draw on my wall. It's really similar to the thing that's right outside. I, I really like that with the stick and you guys should try that when you leave. So it creates this kind of like dialogue, like Sarah, my wife and I were like talking about it and we're like interacting with it. And, and that I really thought was exciting. Um, and then I, I would do things where I would give people copper plates with, with the with the, the ground on it and tell them to put it in their pockets and just walk around for a week. And I'd kind of like pretend to experimentally like look at each person and like why it was different. And I created like little packets from it. But 
what I thought was so exciting about it was that it was, you know, 25 people, you know, 50 people, they all interacted to create this one piece of artwork. So it was really this very primitive version of what I would later create with the sketchbook project. So, you know, I was doing my own artwork and I, I again, did not know what to do with this. I was really intimidated by galleries. I felt it was unfair to charge a submission fee if you were not guaranteed to be in a show, especially artists. Uh, I felt that there should be a community of people that want to work together. And I wanted to kind of find those people. And my, my kind of philosophy of myself is that I'm a perfectionist without being perfect, which uh, I define as if I have an idea, I will find a way to make it happen, regardless of how good it is, how well I've done it. I'm going to find a way to get to the end. So me being me, I, was, I, I decided I was going to start a gallery. Um, so this is Shane and me. That's when I had an extremely big beard. Uh, and then that's us later in life where we got much better looking and grew into our beards. <laughs> so all that I knew of Shane was that we looked just like each other. We were just, you know, two, two young Jewish men, and uh, we were going to school together, and everybody would always be like, you look just like that guy Shane. And I was like, I hated that. I didn't know him. I thought he was a creep. He's not a creep. Uh, we, we, Sarah and I used to uh, use him to cook chocolate chip cookies in his toaster oven in his dorm room, and, and that was the most we really ever interacted. And... Um, I, 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 had, I had all these ideas for art shows. I started to put together art shows with my friends and, you know, really simple things. And Shane would help out with the graphic design. And we, we grew to be friends. And, um, you know, one day we just decided with little money in the bank, we were going to open up an art gallery. Uh, we had made like $150 off of bar tips one night at one of our events. And we were like, we're going for it. Um, <laughs> that's a fun conversation with your parents. Uh, so we found a place that somehow let us uh, sign a lease, and we opened up the first art house gallery uh, in Decatur, Georgia. Um, and we did this like pay-for-play gallery thing, and it was uh, we we hated it. It was like a retail store. That's not what we got into doing this. Uh, we would show up like way late on like the one day we were open a week, and everybody was waiting outside and was upset. Uh, so that didn't work out really well, and we still had this like urge to connect people to to find out who's in this Atlanta, Decatur community, who wants to come out, who wants to be a part of a show. So we came up with this idea to send disposable cameras to people. Um, you know, it was really basic. We're like, we'll send it out, send it back, we'll, we'll develop them and we'll see what happens. And our kind of idea from the beginning was like, how do we create one big piece of artwork with all of these people's vision? So we were like, we're gonna plaster your photos on our gallery wall, that was like our slogan. So. Uh, we, we put up a really primitive website. Shane is, uh, one thing to know is Shane is the digital side of, of Art House and I am the, the analog side. I was the printmaker, he was the graphic designer. So we worked really well together. Um, so we, we started sending these cameras out. I think we, we had a small submission fee. Everybody was guaranteed to be in the show. We used the fee to, to fund the show. And, and this was before um, Kickstarter. I, I did not have that idea. I'm not taking... Uh, claim that I did, but but we used the the fees to to help fund the the idea. Uh, we um, we had 15 people or whatever sign up, and 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 that was exciting to us. We didn't think we would get anybody, and and we had 15. And one morning we woke up and we had like 50 more people sign up, and we were like, "What's going on?" It was it was really exciting. And I ran into Shane's room. We were roommates at the time, and. Um, he was he was also on his computer trying to figure out what had happened. And it ended up being there was this uh, this email newsletter years ago called Yahoo Daily Wire, and we were on like the last one they ever sent out. They like mentioned this little project from Atlanta, and um, so it got all these people to sign up. And and the the couple of things we realized was one people were signing up outside of Atlanta, outside of Georgia. And the second thing was that people were signing up from or emailing us asking if they can sign up from other parts of the world and. That was just like incredibly exciting to us, and we really didn't know what to do with this information, but um, we ended up uh, getting through it, selling about 150 submissions, and we had this really cool show, and it was, you know, I think we could do better, and, and we felt really kind of inspired by it, but we wanted to keep pushing forward, and, and one of my teachers came, and you know, it's one of those teachers that you never get approval from, but you're constantly seeking it, and 
he walks in. His name is, no, I shouldn't even say his name. Uh, it's just a, it's a celebrity name, but he's not a celebrity. Uh, so he came and he, he looked at the, the artwork on the wall and he just kind of gave me that nod and smiled. And I was like, all right, so we're on to something here. Um, that was the one time and only he ever approved of anything I did. Um, so the next thing was like, we kind of started thinking of it like really straightforward. Like what objects can we send out? We send out a disposable camera. Now what can we send out? We've even joked for years. We're like, we're sending out 500 banana peels. Like what can you do? <laughs> and like clearly that wasn't inspiring to anybody. Um, uh, we actually did that as an April Fool's joke and one woman signed up and then was like, I never got my banana peel. Uh, so, anyway, we, we were never really avid sketchers. Neither of us used the sketchbook. Shane was strictly computer, and I just never really used one. And um, somebody mentioned, what about sketchbooks? And we were like, uh, all right. You know, we, we had to pay rent. We had to, like, figure out how to do our next project. So we're like, let's try it. So um, we ended up sending out these little, those little uh, three by five moleskin sketchbooks. We put it up online. We're like, we're going to open this up to 500 people and see what happens. And, and it ended up filling. 500 people signed up in a three-month period. Um, I think our first theme ever was fear. Uh, we just had one theme. We sent the books out, and, uh, and we, were, we waited to get them back. So we started getting these books back. And, and as I said in the beginning, we always kind of expected sketchbooks, sketches, drawings, quick little things. And even from this first primitive version of this show, we have started to see the potential in this project. People were... Uh, turning them into works of art. It wasn't just sketches. It was, it was so exciting to see what people would do. Um, our problem was we didn't know that there was things called labels that you could use for the back of the books. And so we just put sheets of paper inside with their names. And like we ended up losing like all the sheets of paper. It was like really unorganized. Um, you'll see throughout my story that a lot of times we learn out of stupid mistakes. Um, so we had our first show, we laid all the books out on tables and people came and it was a really a kind of exciting thing and, and we decided we were gonna do this on a yearly basis. So I think uh, the next year, which you can see they're kind of in the cardboard boxes, but the next year I decided that I was going to paint cardboard boxes white and put lights in the top of them. This was my big exhibition design that I did here. Um, we also had Sun dandelions, sunflowers, I always call them the right thing. Uh, sunflowers uh, set up, and, and this was like our big thing. The problem was this is how the show started. Um, by the end of the show, it was a pile of books, and people would walk in and say, I really want to see my cousin's book, my book, and we'd be like, go ahead, look through the pile of books and find it. <laughs> we would like hide in the corner and not speak to anyone. Uh, so... We, at one point, you know, we started realizing how much more and more there were people outside of Georgia that were signing up for this project, and we decided that we were going to travel. This was, again, one of those ideas that everyone else in my life was like, that's ridiculous. You're 20-something years old. You're not going to drive around the country with sketchbooks. We had a two-door Honda Civic. We had cardboard boxes painted white. We had sunflowers. Like, none of this equaled a cross-country tour, but somehow spaces agreed to let us come, uh, I convinced people, I worked really hard at that, um, and we packed it up, I said goodbye to Sarah, we got in the car and we drove around the country for two weeks. We ended up hating each other by the end of it, um, but you know, it was a really cool learning experience. It was the first time we really had traveled like that, and it was really cool. So we did this for a few years. We always maxed the project out at 500. We didn't know if we could handle more, we didn't know if we would get more, but it just made more sense to do that. So the first year, which I believe is probably to that late 2008, early 2009, we're like, what, what happens if we don't max it out? And so um, I think this was the year that we started using the bigger moleskin sketchbooks. And so we, we put it out there, no max. We had like 30 themes and we're like, let's see what happens. Uh, we ended up getting um, 2,500 people to sign up for the project. So a big jump for us. Uh, it was kind of exciting. Uh, at one point during one of these tours, we were eating a at a restaurant after one of the shows in Chicago, and, and I was just like, wouldn't it be so cool if we had a library of sketchbooks? And at the time, it seemed so ridiculous, and, and time went by, and we were like, no, actually, that would be really awesome. And Shane's relationship and I was always 
I would stand behind Shane and I would say, can you do this? And he would try to do it. And then I'd be like, can you do this? And I would just keep pushing him to build more and more of this website. And, you know, I, I give myself credit for teaching him how to develop because I kept pushing him more and more. Uh, he had a really, he was really ambitious in what I thought of him. I was really ambitious in what I thought he could do. So um, we created this library system from scratch. We do not use any outside uh, software. It was all built by us, created by us after long late night conversations of what is possible and what's not. Um, so we started going from that and, and we eventually found ourselves with, with more professional exhibition looking things like this. Um, in 2000, uh, late 2009, we did another project where we had 3,500 people. So we went from 2,500 to 3,500 and it was fine. Like there was like the two of us, every once in a while we had like an intern and it, and it really, there were so many times where we were just like ready to give up because it was, it was fun, but it wasn't obviously paying the bills. We weren't really doing it full time. Um, and then 2010 came around and we launched the project, nothing really different it just kind of caught on. And we, that year, had 28,000 people sign up for the sketchbook project. Um, so we went from two bearded Jewish men sitting in an office like by ourselves packaging these sketchbooks to like we had four interns. We had like three staff members. Like it was this crazy thing. Uh, the disappointing thing about the sketchbook project is we only get about a third of the books back that we send out. Um, so that year we ended up getting 10,000 sketchbooks back, which is still an obscene amount of number, number of books to drive around the country. So we rented a box truck, we built uh, movable white shelves, we loaded them into the back of the truck. Our first ever like cross country show was in Austin, Texas for South by Southwest. Uh, in 2011, we drove across the country, we opened the back of the truck and every single sketchbook had fallen off the shelf. No one ever thought that the books would just sit on the shelf for a, a four-day drive. Uh, and that's just a side note. So we somehow, there was like six of us, we loaded up 10,000 books, put them back. Keep in mind, they're all in order. Uh, we had to put them all back in, on the shelf in, in like a couple hours anyway. So um, we did that for a couple years. And the next year, we, we, we had started using tension rods to keep the books in. And the next year, we built sliding like plexiglass that goes in. So we had these like really cool evolutions. Uh, what always kept coming to mind was the fact that we needed seven people to drive this truck around the country because there was so much unloading. There was so much work. Uh, we started to develop a kiosk system. Uh, you'll see outside that it's, it's not this. But when we first started doing it, we had a, a table in front. And people came up to us and asked us, and they told us what they wanted to see, and we were searching, and it was so exhausting for us to do this. And everyone's like, I just want to search myself. And we're like, we wish we could do that, but that's not an option. Um, so we, you know, we, we kept being like, oh, it would be so cool to have a mobile library. And one day we had this like really highly caffeinated meeting, um, and we, um, we just like started coming up with these crazy ideas. We were going to build a house on wheels that... We have like 3D diagrams of this house on wheels. Um, it was really, really exciting. But then we kind of took it back and we were like, let's build something really simple. Let's build a mobile library that's just easy to get around. Um, so somehow we ended up with 37 feet to drive around the country, which really isn't that simple. But uh, so we got our little mobile library. Uh, we, again, we designed this whole thing. Uh, my wife, Sarah, did it at all in Google SketchUp. Our graphic designer did all of the branding. Uh, the only thing that we had help with was the shelves inside of it, which you can kind of see on the left there. Um, we had them built by this guy who, who we got the trailer from. He usually does this for like Ferrari. And so this was like a cool little side project for him. So now we have the system. We have the shelves. We have the, our, our bars that come up and lock all of the books in place. Um, it was, it kind of was this really exciting change. Uh, then we kind of reached the summer of 2013 where we were like, we're going to go on a 35 city tour around the country. Uh, so we're kind of at the end of that here, but for two and a half months, uh, my wife and I drove around the country. We drove 11,000 miles. We visited all four uh, corners of the United States as far north as Portland, Maine and Toronto, as far south as Orlando and uh, Los Angeles, and all the way up to Portland, Oregon, uh, and everywhere in between. Um, it, was, it was this really crazy, exhausting adventure. 
and uh, now we passed it off to other people to drive. So it's less us. So these are little stats about us. These were updated just the other day. Um, we have currently 27,889 sketchbooks in our collection. Uh, most Keep in mind, we did not start keeping the books until 2010. So that's really just in the past three and a half years or so. Uh, we have approximately 1 million uh, pages in the collection. Obviously, that's a rough estimate, but we thought that was kind of interesting to think about. Uh, we've had 53,000 library cards issued, and that's all over the world. Uh, 135,910 checkouts, uh, not just in, in our mobile library and in our permanent space in, in Brooklyn. Um, that miles traveled is not updated from this summer. So there's about 13 or 14,000 miles added to that. Uh, I think they're cool. Uh, we also have a digital library, which Amy mentioned, but we have about 16,000 books Actually, it should be on there. We have 14,071 books in our digital library. And we, I don't know what that little nine is there, but we have uh, 2,340,000 views of books in the digital library. And that's not page views. That's actually like someone loading a book. Um, it doesn't count the page views of each book. So it's, that's really cool to us. And we've had 80,000 people sign up for our projects around the country. So in, in seven years, we've had a quite a big reach. We've had also 135 different countries participate in our projects. Uh, we've traveled as far as uh, London, and we are traveling this summer or this fall to Australia for the first time uh, at the University of Melbourne. So we believe strongly at the Sketchbook Project that there's this thing where you could be a singular artist or you could be a community of artists. And that doesn't mean that as a community of artists, you have to work together. We believe that the sketchbook project is strong because, yeah, you could create a sketchbook by yourself in your house and like draw on it and, and show it to your friends. But it's really exciting to know that there are people all over the world doing this with you. So I brought a like so Singapore. We have people. We have tons of people from Singapore for some reason. Uh, we have people from uh, Dubai. Uh, we have people from Paris. Uh, and then we have people from Wichita, which apparently Sarah Oldham, everybody seems to know in this town. Uh, I heard she graduated from WSU. Um, but what is so really exciting about the Sketchbook Project is though you, everybody waits to the last minute and you're like at the deadline and you're really trying to get it done. And it's really cool to think about the fact that there are, you know, five to 10,000 people around the world at that moment, probably working on their sketchbooks at the same time. And the fact that it's all gonna come back to the same collection to look at. And we have so many people who come to our shows and, and maybe don't quite understand why it is the way it is. Like, why can't I just grab books off the shelves? Why do I have to do this system? And I think what people forget is that it's, it's this conceptual idea. It's, it's all meant to come together to create this beautiful, Thing. When you walk into our space in Brooklyn, we have 40-foot walls. They're 10-foot tall of sketchbooks and on both sides. And you're completely surrounded by 28,000 books. And, and there's just nothing else like that in the world to, to just know that there are all these stories, there are all these unique perspectives uh, all in one place. And as we've traveled around the world, we have found that we have really affected so many people. When we first started, we never imagined that it would be more than just a fun project for someone. But we have had people who have used this to deal with the fact that they had cancer. One of our second viewed, most viewed books in our digital library with like 7,000 views is about a woman who has survived cancer, made a sketchbook about it. And I, I, I like to think that a lot of people have probably also used her book to do that. We've had marriage proposals through our sketchbooks. We've had people who haven't seen each other in years and have used this as a way to connect. We've had family members who do it. We have uh, in Chicago every year, we meet this uh, lovely lady and her mom and, and she has a little daughter and the three of them work on their sketchbook every year together and it brings them together. Uh, we find every year that there's kind of these themes that we don't present. We have people who, uh, one year there was about five or six books that were about death of their father and not necessarily recently, but just in general. Uh, one story that I always like to tell in, in Oakland, uh, we had a pop-up shop for three weeks uh, about a year and a half ago, and every day this family would come in and they would look for this guy's book, and it was about his father's like legacy and him dying. And, 
it was this really, re, like, really touching story for us to watch this family come in and different members every day flip through this book and, you know, cry over it and connect with it. And uh, we, I don't know why they all can come on the same day, but it was kind of exciting to just see them come and we kept the book out for them because we knew that more were coming. And um, so, I mean, we get, I've never thought that I would do this where I would have people come up to me and tell me that I, I've changed their lives, that we've changed their lives. And, and so when people ask me why I, I do this, I mean, I think that that's, that's probably the simplest answer is that it just means more to so many people than it'll ever, than it could ever mean to me. Like, I want to bring this to people, and I love the conceptual idea. I love that you can walk into a room and do this. People ask me what my favorite book is all the time, and I do not have a favorite book, and I refuse to answer that because to me it is about the collection as a whole, and there's no one single book that will ever make the collection. It's, it's the 28,000 books together that make it so amazing. Uh, I never thought I'd be standing in front of people telling them I had 28,000 books. And after we get all the 2014 books back, we'll have over 30,000 books. So it's, it's, it's this really kind of crazy uh, whirlwind of an experience. So I have this really amazing video I want to show you. Okay. Could you tell us your name and a little bit about yourself? Well, my name's Yoop. And, well, I really like to draw because I'm... Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> and I like making up stuff with them. Like making up stuff. What do you like most about drawing? Well, because you get to do anything with it. You can make spiders, monkeys, you can do um, uh, a pumpkin, um, a pencil, you can make like a Superman, or, and like stuff like that. And you don't have to, there's no mistakes in drawing, so. So what did you make in your book, could you show well, one of um, my favorites is tape map because um, you pretty much can stick to anything ex except for um, gum, which gum is his enemy. So he has to try to defeat some gum. In. And. I drew one of these um, back in there. Would you have any advice for anyone who's going to do the sketchbook project? Well, my advice would be that if you made a mistake, don't start over. Just um, fix it and make sure like it was like part of the drawing and make something up. So we. We did a bunch of these videos throughout the 2012 tour, and this kid was like the most amazing, like what better advice can you ever get from a little kid? Uh, everybody else, we asked the same question, and adults like don't have that view on the world, so we thought that was really amazing, and I thought if you weren't inspired by what I said, I'm always inspired by that video. I watch it all the time because I think it's a really a cute thing. Um, so... So I think that's it. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions you guys have. Uh, well, you know, it's something we talk about a lot. Um, we definitely have room for more, but you know, it's it's also kind of. We, you know, we, we just, we kind of discuss all the time if we want to evolve it in different ways. Do we want more spaces? Do we want to reach different people? Our main focus right now for the project is to kind of get it to as many people as possible. Uh, we do that via the mobile library, and, and New York obviously is a great place to be for that. So many people do come and visit there. But, um, you know, we we could fit probably 10,000 more books in our space, but I think we're, we're really trying to find maybe a unique way to fit more. Uh, we probably gain four to 5,000 plus books a year, so it's definitely something we think about on a daily basis, but uh, I don't know. I guess we like to see how it goes. It's like everything else. It's like an organic change. Um, I think something will come to us one late night when we had too much coffee, <laughs> like everything else. Can you, can, can you repeat the question? So the sure. The yeah, the question was just asking about uh, space issues with the books and how they, they do take up 
Um, we fit about, a, what did we just count the other day? 110 books per three feet or something like that. So it does take up a lot. Uh, the question was about uh, if we ever, I, I guess, consider returning the books to the artist. We we don't. I mean, that I, that's my favorite part of the project. I think it makes it special. I think it makes people really commit to it and really, you know, put their heart into it. Um, what, that was another thing that I had decided to do and a lot of hesitation from even Shane and, and from other people who were working with. No one believed that people would, would do this and, and send their artwork. And, of course, there's still people who question that but i think that's that's just the point like it's it that is why we do this i think the collection is so special and i think that you could make a book and stick it and you know work on it but at some point it's going to end up in a drawer or in your closet most likely we are a public space that's open seven days and people can come see it one thing i didn't notice was that no or tell you was that every artist if they have it on will get a notification when you're someone's reading their book regardless of if we're traveling or in our space in brooklyn so people are always up to date on like if people are looking at it and I think it's we get you know tweets all the time that people are like it's so cool like three years later to get a, a notification so I think people really once they commit to sending it enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. Um, question was about ideas of uh, kind of curatorial shows and you kind of using the collection, I think, in another way after their initial summer tour. And, and yes, um, that was one of the main other reasons we wanted to get the mobile library was we could never do that before. It was just too much of a production. The mobile library allows us to, to travel so much more. We, um, back in November, did a show, uh, there's a blog, This Is Colossal. I don't know if any of you guys check it out. If you don't, it's amazing, our blog. I, I highly recommend it. Chris Jobson, who writes it, is a, is a good friend of ours and a, an amazing uh, art blogger. But he, um, he came, we flew him into New York. Uh, Ugg, the boot company, sponsored this whole thing. We flew him in. Uh, he went through all the books. He picked out a 1,000 of his favorites. He went, that was when we had before the 2013 books, we had 22,000 books. He looked through every single book in three days. So I think he might be like one of the few people that have literally can say he's probably seen every single one of them. Uh, he picked a thousand. We went to three different cities and it was a really cool experience. It was kind of a test for us. Like some things worked, some things didn't, but we really do want to get back into that because we would love to take the books back out on the shelf um, because, you know, some of them haven't traveled since 2011 and that's something that we're working on. I mean, of course, like every arts organization, every small business, it's all, you know, it's about funding. So in that case, we were able to do it. Um, in, in the case of like going to Australia, we're bringing all the Australian books in the collection and that's being made possible from MailChimp, the online email provider. So we're, we're really thankful to them and, and to be able to do these things because of those companies. Uh, yeah, question is about our digital library and how books get into that. It's, it's actually up to the artist um, because it's, it's such a long process. We have a, you know, it's a person who digitizes each book. Um, there's so much infrastructure on our website that allows us to do this, that the artists pay a little bit extra for the digital version. Um, it's actually one of the first kind of, it's the, probably the oldest feature on our site. So it's like, it's kind of the bane of our existence. It's, we love it to death, but it's like really uh, kind of difficult to work with, but it's something that we're trying to enhance. It's such a cool part of it. Um, so anyone who wants to be in it can be in it. And we don't, um, by the way, we don't jury any of the books ever. The only thing we ever do is put a red dot on the back of the books if there's adult content. So we don't give it to little children, but um, yeah, other than that, everything goes up. Yeah, uh, so we sell the sketchbooks year-round, the submissions. Um, you can buy them online. You can buy them in person. Uh, we Every November 1st is when it resets. So all the books you buy up until November 1st are due January 15th. 
and then it starts over. So you always kind of have a year to work on your book. Um, so the earlier you buy it in the year, the more time that you have. Uh, she asked how the books uh, were are made. I mean, it's all different mediums, paint, pencil, uh, photography, other weird things. Um, <laughs> we've definitely got some crazy books. Uh, you know, it's we really try to make to stress to everyone that participates that it is it is a traveling collection. Your book will travel fifteen thousand miles around the country. You gotta keep that in mind. Like it's in a truck, like it's being handled. It's not. You know, we're such an informal space that you know, things will organically happen over time. We obviously do our best to, you know, we're never like throwing books around, but but uh, things happen, but we, you know, you just, you try to keep it as, as safe as you can. And every year we learn new things, like uh, with the mobile library, we realize you can't use like Mod Podge, your book will in the humidity, that's it, it sticks together. So there's a couple of books like that that we'll send back to the artists and they can repair them. And, um, you know, we, absolutely hate glitter. That is our number one rule. <laughs> because no one thinks about the fact that like whoever opens the books is like covered in glitter when they're done. So uh, we have very few rules as far as that, but we really just encourage people to not like damage other books or, or damage their own book. Yeah. Yeah, um, the question was, I guess, generally about our funding and kind of uh, how we, I guess, almost deal with like criticism of, of where, is that what you're asking, kind of? Well, I mean, not so much criticism, but like, are there ways that people that are still trying to have the means to participate? Yeah, um, so uh, he's asking about people who, who might not have the means to participate. Uh, we do offer group discounts, educational discounts. Uh, we know it's not much. Unfortunately, it's ridiculously expensive to drive the mobile library around the country. You know, it's it's we even the twenty five dollars uh, because we're getting your money because we get the twenty five dollars a year before we even travel, and it needs to fund our staff through. Then, it's it's just not actually like a sustainable business model as it is. Um, we, you know, do everything we can to help communities like that find grants. Um, and uh, we, our, our guy who does, Andrew, who does our customer support and also does groups, helps, you know, direct people in, in ways that, that might help. And, and we really encourage people, a lot of times local businesses, schools will help to bring sketchbooks to the community. And we found that that works really well. Um, we, uh, as far as the funding question, which everybody always asks us, you know, it's, it's, we help, you know, it helps with sponsorships, it helps to have the more people that are involved. And we see it less like that pay for play because I don't, I hate that term because I think there's like this kind of, there is a negative context to it. There's a lot of galleries that just do these quick exhibitions where you pay and they throw the work on the wall and that's it. Um, you know, I think we really try to go above and beyond. We have like this whole system that alerts you when your book's being viewed. We have the library system we've built. We have the permanent space where your book lives forever in Williamsburg, in Brooklyn, which is the most expensive rent probably in the country, uh, and they're raising that currently. <laughs> um, we, you know, we try, like literally, we have six or seven staff members, like Jess here is our assistant director and also driving the mobile library around the country. And um, so we do the best we can with what we have. And again, it's, it is a labor of love. It's really tough sometimes, but, I, I see it more like as a Kickstarter model where the more people that participate, the more we're able to do. And, and we've, you know, we've proven that and, and every year that we've had more people, we've done more and made the exhibitions more exciting. It's also really exciting when, place, when people like Amy bring us here because it allows us to do a lot more. Like we probably would have been in Wichita for four hours if at all. And it's really awesome that we get to come here for the whole weekend and do this. So that's, that's something we're moving towards, which will help maybe take some of the cost off of, of the community.
No, uh, we have a, uh, he's asking about, I guess, rights to the work once they send it to us. We have a, um, we, we believe your artwork is your artwork. You obviously have to grant us the license to use your work for anything we need to use it for, but you always retain your ownership of your work. Um, if somebody were to steal your work, you, you can sue the crap out of them. Like, that's all on you. Uh, you know, we don't. We don't ever. We never set out to own the artwork. That's not it. I mean, we own the object of the of the book. But if you drew it, it's, it's your thing. Um, this is straight on our our terms of use, uh, and um, that's how we like to do things around here. A lot of people, you know, always are like, "Oh, you know, you're you're. I'm just sending you my artwork," and like that's not what we're out. I mean, we could have done that years ago. That's not what we're here for. We don't sell any of the books. People have offered to buy books. That is, we've never taken that up on them, uh, taking that up. So um, yeah, you always you always are the owner of your work. Yeah, um, well, you know, you make a library card. Uh, we, you know, we always try to check back. It is a incredibly organic process. I'm not going to lie and say that it's, it's not a possibility. It's totally a possibility. I think people understand that going into it. I mean, we travel, people, it, it is an honor system. We cannot, it, it, will, it wouldn't work if we were like guarding everybody and like checking. I'm sorry, I didn't, she asked about the security of the books and if people steal them. Um, we have had little instances of it ever being an issue. One artist stole their own book which is weird because we're like, if you, re I mean, if people beg us for their book back and have a legitimate reason, like, you know what, that's fine. Like, if it's like, you know, we've had people who like did a book about a family member who then died and like wanted the book back. And it's like, I get that. So, um, you know, and, you know, other than that, like we've had very few instances where it's been an issue and it's always something like kind of fishy, like something went wrong and, um, you know, we do the best we can, but it is, it is definitely an organic process and we keep track of everything, um, but but we, we hope that people are honest in the world. And I think most people are. I think when you kind of give people freedom, they almost feel like, I shouldn't take this. If we had more security, I feel like there might be more like, oh, now I can break the rules. <laughs> uh, we, you know what's funny is we've had a lot of celebrities buy books, but We've never gotten one back. <laughs> They're too busy, I guess. Uh, no, the, well, just recently, we tried to convince Maybe from Arrested Development came into the store, and we tried to convince her to buy the book, but she bought, uh, we have a little notebook line called Pocket Department that we did with Princeton Architectural Press. She did buy that, so we're excited about that. Uh, and uh, Adrian Grenier bought a book once, but he never finished it. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, yeah uh, he asked about making an app. Um, these are all things we would love to do and uh, are unable to because we don't have the resources to do it. But it's we have like endless ideas of what we could do with this collection. Obviously, there's so many like visual, I mean, we have endless, like a million pages of artwork that no one, that people aren't seeing and we want to get it out there and uh, we think about this stuff all the time and I hope that's something that will happen soon. Um, it's kind of funny with, you know, my one thing that I talked about, I had learned about people wanting human interaction. It's the same with, with companies that want to sponsor you. I always present digital ideas like apps, redoing the digital library and everybody wants to like help us share the collection with the world, like even MailChimp wants us to share the collection with, with people, so, which is cool. And of course we would love, to, we love to do that. So it's, it's really exciting to kind of see that shift to the real world again, but, but unfortunately no app right now. If you know anyone, any of you students want to build us an app, we'd love it. <laughs> Well, uh, Shane, uh, no, um, 
Well, yeah, so we, we have a, a really awesome system. It's, it's not as simple as it seems. Uh, the first part about it is that we have our own kind of Dewey Decimal System. As we get books back, there, we scan them, and it, and it puts them in the categories by theme. Um, when you, if you go check out the mobile library, in the back of each book, there's three numbers. Uh, the first number being the section it's in, the second number being the section within that section, Excuse me, and the last one being the book, the one through ten of that section. So um, that's really cool. And then each artist can catalog their books. It's about fifteen different ways. It's uh, mood, material, color, location, artist name, anything else, theme, tags. So we have like kind of hashtag things. You can anyone can set five tags. We have color. So we have all these really cool ways people can set their their or catalog their book. Um, so when you go to our kiosk system, uh, we we kind of we the system knows which books are there, obviously, and um, and then when you search for something, it, it looks for the book that has that criteria with the least amount of views. So we have a very democratic system where it tries to get as many books viewed as possible. We have never had a problem where not all of the books have been viewed at least once, if not you know, many more times than once. But they always, by halfway through each tour, it's always really exciting the day that every book has been viewed once when we get them back. Um, but it's really it's cool because people are like, well, I want to see books about architecture. And, and you can do that. Oh, the profession is one of them. So you can look not only for architects who made books, but you can look search tags for architecture. If you could search you know, dog in, in, tag, in tags, you'll find a book with a dog on it usually, which is pretty exciting. So uh, it's a really cool system. It was, it was years of, of talking about it and, and, and trial and error and, and trying things that didn't work and, and trying to fix it. And a lot of me standing over Shane's shoulder and um, Shane kind of is this amazing computer genius where he kind of figures out how to do stuff that I give him. I give him really crazy tasks. I'm like, can we do this? And he's like, two months later, comes out of like his cave, and it's done, which is awesome. So, yeah. Well, we have a big random button first off, which will put you know two books that have been viewed the least which is cool, but um, oh, our system also picks one book you search for and then a random book, which is always the book next to it. It helps to like streamline the process so we can get the books faster for you and we can put them back faster. Um, but uh, if you are looking for, um, if you don't know what you're looking for, my biggest pet peeve is when people point to books. And I know that makes sense in the real world, but in my like idea of the project, that was never the point. Like I love the idea that you don't know what you're going to get. And like, you can't, and like, it's the most, the biggest cliche is you can't judge a book by its cover. But some of our most amazing books are the skinniest, just brown covers. They didn't change anything. So I just like say, go for it. Like, mess around. We make it really easy for you. Like, if you just want to search for the color green, you can search for the color green and see what you get. And you know, it's, it's very like, uh, it's not as like, people are like, well, I searched for, uh, you know, dogs, and there's no dogs in here. But if you kind of look deeper, there's like maybe something about dogs. And it's like, it's all done by the artist. It's all, you know, crowdsourced information. So it's really cool to, to kind of see. And I think if people think about it that way, like, why did someone choose to tag their book with what I did, which is kind of what makes it exciting. And it kind of gives you a little background into what they did. Um, but I think once you scan your library card and you get on that screen and make sense to you, you'll see that it's kind of fun to play around with. So we're like a reference library, so no one can ever like leave the area we're in. Um, you can look at them there as long as you want, but you know you can keep bringing them up and look at more. Um, and uh, it's it's kind of a fun process. I always hear people who are like, um, I can't stop looking at them, because you because some of them are real quick. Maybe some you're not into, but you, you you keep wanting to find that like amazing book. And then some people just you know really want to study each one and, and see um, what happens. Anybody else? Yeah. What do you mean? I don't think so. 
<laughs> Maybe. Uh, uh, no, I think the most people get riled up about is not being able to point to the books. <laughs> That's like our biggest controversy. Uh, we, um, you know, and we're very tech based and people I think get frustrated sometimes with having to use the computer to, um, to like kind of search for things. People are like, why, why can't I just, because it's, we're so analog, but we're so digital at the same time. But I don't know if that's really a controversy, but. Yeah. No, oh, she asked about the adult content books and if that's a controversy. Uh, I don't know, I, I think it was, it was just kind of like, we kept handing creepy books to <laughs> children. And the next obvious answer was we should stop doing that. Uh, we, it also was that we were trying, at some point Shane was building that into the system that it would, wouldn't, we could like know that, but um, it just was like taking so long. We're like, let's just put red dots. Like that just makes sense. We don't really, we didn't, like, we fought it for a while because we didn't like to pull anything out. We don't want, to like set something different, but when you hand an eight year old's, you know, creepy books, it's no good. <laughs> so. Yes, we, we all do. It's actually currently a requirement of all of our staff. We have a day that we always like, all have like an extra week than everybody else because they're all a bunch of bums. No, I'm just kidding. Um, everybody makes a book. Uh, Surprisingly, Shane and I did not make a book until the 2012 tour. And, and again, because we had never really done sketchbooks and we were, it just, we just like never had the time. And we're, but that's the excuse I hate from everybody else. So one day, everyone kept asking us. We felt like weirdos not have done books. So we do them every year now. And um, it's really cool to, to do the process. Like we learned so much about it because I was like, oh, you know, I'll do it the last week and it'll be easy. And it's not like you, you want to make it awesome. You want to make it something more than just a sketchbook. And so uh, I think, you know, a lot of our staff is really into it. And we talk about it for like weeks and we're like brainstorming. And um, then we have our cool little like, not critique, we're all really nice to each other. <laughs> uh, you know, we show it off to everybody. And, and yeah, they're part of the collection, which a lot of people, now that we have books, I don't, I don't feel like people ask that much if I have a book. But before then, of course, everybody asked when I didn't have a book. Uh, you can search by name. Uh, he asked if you can search by name. You can search by name. Uh, it's it's in there by theme. That's just how our system was originally built, um, which it's kind of, now that we have these tours like Capes, Mass, and Tights, that's actually the theme ends the tour. We've got this like, because we've evolved, but we didn't want to rewrite the system every time. It, it has some kind of weird levels going on these days. But uh, like, so next year we have all these regions that we're doing it. Um, which is another kind of cost uh, effective thing we're doing. It just no longer is effective for us to, for, for $25 to drive the book around the country. We were losing money every year. So we, we split it up into regions. You get to pick where you want to go. Um, and so those are kind of, those are the theme, the tour, you know, everything in one. Um, and then we have like a new level for theme and it's, you know, it's, it's just a learning process. It's tough. Shane, um, Shane is still involved in kind of like a, we're, you know, we're best friends and we talk and he helps out with stuff, but he, he actually has another job now. So we don't really have a full-time developer. So we kind of figure this stuff out on our own. I know like very little, so I'm like trying to make stuff happen, but yeah, it's, it is, it's cool. I mean, I, I think I love that it's like organic. I don't, you know, I look at other websites in the world. I think we're, we're okay compared to like a lot of these other websites that are always crashing. I don't know where I'm going with this, but. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. 
Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to warn everybody, remind you that you're getting a library card. So if I see you down there and you keep clicking the adult content button, hoping for one of them with the red dots, I'll know who you are. Um, please join us on McKnight Arts Center Plaza. Sketchbook Project Mobile Library is getting ready to show up. And, of course, I look forward to seeing everybody at Shift Space tomorrow night for one of the best Final Fridays ever. See you then.